Hello, and welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's Lily Hall, and I'm a curator here at the showroom. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you all today for this roundtable discussion um, on the occasion of the launch of Naveen G. Khan Dostos' publication, Tina, There Is No Alternative. It's co-published by The Showroom and Chateau International, and it's been designed by Mark Harrell. The discussion's being recorded on film um, and will be available on the showroom website and screened at the interconnected launch this coming Saturday the 15th of October at Claire de Rouen Books from 12 to 4 p.m. So speaking today here, um, we're Rob for Walker, Tarek Yunus, Az Farshafi, William Skeeping, Hassan Bada, Lillian Wilkie, Mark Hurrell, and Naveen G. Kandosos. Um, the publication builds on Naveen's exhibition that took place here at the showroom in 2019. Um, there was Alternative was the title, just as the book, and it took shape as a performative durational installation combining live painting, a research archive that finds some of its form in the publication, um, and um, a series of workshops and talks and events that were all open to the public. So the exhibition and now this book takes as a starting point the ongoing research into the complex context of the UK's government's development of pre-crime and surveillance policies, in particular prevent, questioning the politics of the representation and positioning of care that the strategies around those policies generate. At the core of the project has been an act of questioning what an alternative to prevent could look like involving a shared process between Naveen and all those who became collaboratively involved. A democratic process which this publication and this dialogue this evening now seeks to ex extend further. The launch and distribution of TINA is part of CAGE's international witness campaign for which the showroom is a partner, marking 20 years of the failed global war on terror since 9-11. Uh, Tina has been supported using public funding by Arts Council England and forms part of our transdisciplinary programme, Radical Citizenship, which is a cooperative project between the showroom and the Goethe Institute, London. So now we'll hand over and start the dialogue for this evening. Yeah. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with everyone this evening, actually. I think that um, this book is an end point or a conclusion to a process that we've been involved in, I've been involved in for a number of years, but a lot of people in the space have been involved in, in terms of prevent for much, much longer. Um, and we've all created this book during an incredibly difficult couple of years. Um, I realized the last time I came into this space, like I was a different person. Um, I literally now have a baby and I wasn't even pregnant the last time I was in this space. So that's an incredible thing to have gone through. Um, but also I feel like making this book has also been part of that time um, and the fact that anything that was achieved during this time for me is a bit of a miracle, actually. Um, and that it's still come out before the Independent Prevent Review, um, I think is an even <laughs> bigger achievement. Um, but this would not be possible without um, all the people who are here as contributors, um, but also the support around the show, um, and Rob in particular, who is the editor, um, of the book and um, whose research into this is what kind of and his own personal experiences are what kind of brought me into um, the importance of looking and spending time with Prevent and really thinking it through um, and it's an exciting time because Rob's own book is coming out um, pretty much at the same time in a few weeks yes. and we'll be showing that on Saturday as well and sharing it. Um, but yeah, this, this kind of, uh, this evening is just a real chance to have a bit of a chat about, um, well, what it's like to physically hold the book and what our contributions maybe mean, um, having gone through the last couple of years and the kind of long process, um, and where Prevent is and where the review is and where our research is, and maybe how that's been kind of shifted and formed by what we've, what we've gone through with this kind of COVID era. And I think there are some interesting things to talk about, about. Um, how that's reframing ideas of um, protection, um, not just in the symbols and logos that we now see all the time being used in very, very different ways, but um, how that reaches into kind of mental health issues or community issues or, you know, all kinds of things. So this is just a really kind of open space to start to talking a little bit about those and, and to kind of touch on the book as well and some of the things that, well, are a starting place for that as well. 
Um, but yeah, I wanted to maybe start and ask uh, Lillian, who's um, the co-publisher, um, like in terms of thinking about how prevents it, the, how Tina sits within um, your kind of larger kind of uh, collection of recently published books. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, thank you, Lillian. First of all, uh, thank you to Lillian the showroom. Um, this book is definitely a little bit of a departure from the type of content that I've previously published under Shatter International, which is a very small-scale, um, low-budget, artist-run imprint that I have been running loosely since 2016, um, beginning with a project with the artist Sophie Mallet. And I've worked quite consistently with arts organisations. Um, and part of my background as a bookseller and as an editor has allowed me to develop strategies for artists to kind of communicate their ideas in, in new forms and to think about the publication as, um, as a device, as a tool, um, but also think about publishing more broadly as a kind of uh, a mode of address and not something which is simply about printing paper and then sticking it in a box and leaving it in the studio. You know, publishing is actually literally making a public and um, and distribution is a bit more of a kind of radical act and a strategy. Um, but when I first approached you about this, I mean, we were talking about making a zine and I was sort of imagining, you know, as using the printer downstairs and yeah. doing something that's just super low budget and um, <laughs> a bit more immediate. And, you know, two years later, we're here with this really gorgeous actually quite kind of almost luxurious object and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the design later um, but I guess it it became clear quite quickly just as the exhibition involved multiple modes of address and multiple languages both visual and verbal and um, I guess um, political that a zine might not suffice necessarily in terms of and not only distilling the themes of the show, but this was a conversation that needed to carry on and needed to keep um, generating new conversations and bringing new voices in. Um, so it was a huge challenge, honestly, you know, um, for a small imprint, but incredibly rewarding. And, and I feel like the book has, um, to a, to, I'd say to a full extent, quite succeeded in um, not only fulfilling my own ambitions and kind of objectives as a publisher and as an editor, but also tuning into what I think is um, a political necessity of publishing in terms of uh, keeping the conversation going and inviting new voices in and being prepared for it to be messy and a bit difficult um, and that the book needn't be um, conclusive, um, the book can be alive, there can be aliveness. Um, to it, despite it, um, you know, I think <coughs> looking kind of snazzy and being kind of, you know, we had some really exciting conversations about green thread <laughs> and, pa and paper stock <laughs> and texture and, um, but so I don't know if that necessarily answers your, your question, but yeah, this is a departure. Um, Chateau International has always sought to be um, politically provocative um, and to champion um, marginalised voices, um, really sort of generally working with with um, women and marginalised genders. Um, so this is the scope of this is is mm. is huge. It's been an incredible learning curve, really, and like a real pleasure to be able to publish so many important dialogues, especially some of the dialogues that were um, especially commissioned. You know, I'm very proud mm. to be able to say that we put this out into the world. Mm. I think also like one of the things I love about it is that we really held on to throughout the book was keeping a plastic cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like quite a weird decision, but actually a really important one because when we thought about this, it's also got to be a book that works as um, a reference document. Like it's mm. not just like a coffee table book. It's something that we want to be in libraries and in universities and that has to be handled and has to be able to be taken out and checked in and checked out and have like a tag in the front. Like, do they do still do that in libraries where you still like stamp yeah. out oh, the book, yeah. right? You know, like that's how I envisage it. And that's why having this plastic cover is like, it's wiped clean, you know, like I want it to be handled by students and mm. to be like a reference book. 
because you know it has an incredibly powerful amount of information in it and um, you know I think specifically like the archive section which is actually a big bulk of the book um, which is basically Rob's bibliography for his PhD yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know like do you feel like looking at that now as a kind of palimpsest as we've, we've called it with Mark. Yeah, I mean, it, it works even because we've, we've seen lots of copies of this in um, sort of PDF copies, and I think you quite get a feel for it. But now we've got this, this palimpsest, you can actually, you know, see the documents overlaid on each other. Um, and for me, actually, I mean, more for me was coming into the exhibition for the first time and finding my, my mind was kind of laid out in the archive, everything mm -hmm. I've been thinking about for the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing, the thing that really pleases me about this is to have, um, that you held on, well, you, after you'd read my PhD, I remember you saying that you wanted to call it Tina, which is a really obscure philosophical point. It's a critical realist point, which is a, an obscure point within an obscure philosophy. Um, and it, it's saying that if anyone ever says there is no alternative, as Margaret Thatcher forever said, um, they're, 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 they're not telling a the truth. Mm. There is always an alternative in, in any situation. Um, and the reason I wrote about it is that I've had, on countless occasions now, have had civil servants working in Prevent tell me that there is no alternative to Prevent, which immediately, as you hear anyone say that, then you need to, a red light needs to go off because you know that that's mm. not the case when someone says that. So it's just it's so important that that's, that's in there and, and at forf the forefront of it. Yeah. And it's kind of also, you know, I think as, a, you know, as an academic, but, you know, we've all worked we all a lot of this work in kind of areas, well, I'm an artist, I don't consider myself an activist, but um, we all work in areas that are bordering on activism and, and social change. But it still feels like a kind of arts document somehow. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting to ask, like, Hassan, can you imagine, like, seeing this in the Goldsmiths Library? And, like, I'd be interested to see how you sort of see this in terms of, like, how you would imagine it coming across it. I mean, you're obviously a contributor. But like, how do you think, or how do you, do you have any feelings about how this kind of fits between these different worlds of like the art world and these kind of worlds of thinking about what's beyond it and prevent is obviously a very different part of the world. Well, you mentioned goldsmiths because that's where all the artists go and study. Yeah. But, um, and I can definitely see it being placed within goldsmiths and having, being referenced in seminars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what's interesting, I suppose, is what mine and the amazing Dr. Saad Habib um, mm. conversation that we had in, in, uh, touched upon is the fact that this has come out within this art space, within this arts, uh, and you mentioned this public um, money as well, and that's so there's quite a, a, a difference when, in terms of these conversations, whether it's critically engaged or whether it's policy engaged, whether how present prevent is within campuses, etc. Mm -hmm. That conversation switches quite a lot when you start thinking how present prevent is perhaps in art museums or art galleries because on one hand there is you can point to moments particularly if you're looking at the UK context um, after 7-7 etc like festival Muslim cultures etc where there was these um, cultural moments that attempted to uh, address some sort of Islam in Britain and and, and look, look at the good Muslims on, on display, etc. And there was this funding pool that would come in to create programming within these art spaces. But then those things don't really, they never really took root mm. like they did within university, within other civic and community structures. And I think it comes, so my research is mainly looking at uh, Muslims in Britain in British art museums. But what that really then really looks at, uh, it raises the question of just, religion and secularism within these spaces and the fact and that's the conversations the interesting con conversations that we've had as well as the conversation I have with Sade in here is a strange moment occurs that I suppose the art world and the museum world are so confidently secular that they don't feel Muslims are present within that mm. so somehow the policies of secure like uh, policing that experience or securitizing that experience hasn't isn't like on the in in an explicit way yeah. there so if you look at if you ask what museums or art galleries have connected with prevent etc that you can't really tangibly mm. um pull that out like you can in other civic uh, spaces in campuses in uh, community development 
agencies and perhaps that's why a bubble has been created somewhere in like the showroom mm. where something lit like this can be, can be possible, this publication can be possible, the exhibition that you had possible, the critique and the conversation and the people you've brought in together to have this cross, um, cross collaborative, uh, very honest conversation mm. of it is uh, perhaps is more possible within that but also very interesting in terms of um, yeah, it, highlighting that question of what role it has it had within the arts, how explicitly or how implicitly it's been mm. there. And also, like, what it can have as a conversation going forward. Like, it's not, like we say, it's like not an endpoint. It's a, it's a resource that hopefully will like keep moving stuff forward, uh, yeah. right? But on, on that note, I do, I do like. Um, there's always like an anxiety, even in like my own research, in terms of if I'm researching to contribute perhaps a, 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 a greater thinking and consideration of Muslim presence within the art space and the, the museum space, what is the natural conclusion then those kind of policies that follow Muslims in all other walks of life will ultimately start being present within those spaces mm -hmm. as well. So on one hand, this is an amazing liberatory book, but when you mention around like where is it going to be present, I know you mentioned Goldsmiths, but if we look at Goldsmiths through the arts side of yeah. things, is it going to be present within art galleries, et cetera, and engaged with? On one hand, I'd love to vote to be so, but it would be very interesting to see if that, if it is being starting to engage within mm. art spaces, what might follow? Would yeah. you would a, a scope that hasn't been there, and it, and it would just reveal a lot of uh, theories and realities that many people, other contributors have articulated in talking yeah. about other fields. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just a quick note on that. I mean, I'll stop talking now, no, but no, just no, a quick up, note on that. I mean, I was just reading today this um, this morning in like the arts newspaper had like a article around um, the Louvre in France are doing this um, uh, like na national arts program of Islamic art, leading it and having 18 exhibitions in 18 different cities mm. uh, to, to, they say, they're framing it to challenge Islamophobia and tell the story of Islam which is super interesting. It's a government-sponsored initiative. At the yeah. same time, these, like, um, like a, it's like it's a museum, art museum initiative. Yeah. At the same time, this onslaught is going on in terms of civil liberty organizations being closed, masjids being closed, mosques being closed, etc. And that's and not it, part of the conversation. That's yeah, not part exactly. of exactly. And it uh, made that... The Louvre is not going to be showing that. Exactly. It's not going to be showing that. And it kind of just made that... It makes me think of the role of those arts and cultural spaces, mm. they can slip into, yeah, just like on one hand, they can come in at the moment to when the trend is right to start facilitating a, a conversation of what is perhaps an Islam that is best um, accepted within this as defined by the state. But at the same time, yeah, once um, the, the, that living Islam can't be digested by those museums mm -hmm. for that conversation yeah. to happen. Yeah, totally. And Cage, I mean, also do a huge amount of publishing um, and are doing a huge drive at the moment, which this is part of, in terms of like a moment of remembering 9-11. Like but how do you feel like this sits within all the publishing that you've done? I mean, Cage has done so much over the years, but how do you feel this kind of document sits? Does it sit in any way, in an interesting way, like with the rest of what Cage does is... I mean, I feel it's definitely interesting in terms of, it's very different to our sort of standard model of, um, like when academic, when academic style, a sort of NGO, we do, do a lot of like, research based on, you know, hard facts, case studies, and so on and so forth. So it's definitely a departure from our standard model. And I think that's interesting in that respect. Um, speaking, I guess, like this particular contribution that um, myself, my colleague Shazana, and, and I'm all made, is about, um, so it came in the context of, if you remember the beginning of last year, January 2020, there were like a few stories that came out, especially in The Guardian, I think, um, Whereby groups like political groups like Extinction Rebellion and other ones are sort of found to be uh, have been like, placed on that government kind of terror lists or like mm -hmm. uh, watch lists and so on and so forth. And our discussion was the context of how do we sort of build solidarity, uh, so, sorry, that solidarity around this moment where we clearly see that what has been the case for right now but became more explicit over it then of like um, for it becoming more politicized and uses a political, sort of politically motivated um, tool uh, beyond the sort of um, core audience sort of like Muslims are being, being targeted and how do, you sort of, how do you overcome sort of like the organizational, the ideological and sort of you know, the psychological barriers of solidarity that have been thrown up in the last 20 years of war on terror uh, that sort of like place Muslims beyond sort of the, beyond the realm of solidarity, beyond the sort of realm of being worthy of, of, of reaching out to. And I think it was an interesting conversation because it happened at, um, at that point in that time 
where it sort of had seen like one path to social change that could be shut off, you know, with the general election 2019, and so also the beginnings of what become very hard, like law and order turn on this government. Also, we're just going to lockdown, um, and we're yet to see sort of the upsurge of like, for example, like in the, in the months afterwards. So, so we're stuck in the middle period trying to figure out where are we now, where have we come, how have we got here, how do you sort of organise out of that? Having solidarity and sort of um, like building together was a key key a component of that. So it's a bit random about answering it. I think it's interesting to see like it's definitely an approach to what we take in the book. And I think, for example, our, our conversation was an interesting sort of uh, I guess snapshot into a, into a very weird time like for everybody, especially in terms of um, anti print organizing and to see where like um, some questions we'd raised at the time have sort of been clarified since then, and some still remain as valid. Um, so I think it's, a good, it's like a yeah, good snapshot and a testament to what we think at the time. I think it's important for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let us on the record now. Yeah. And Will, is the other part of that conversation with Cage, like yeah. how is it, how, what's happened since? I think it's really interesting because, like, it's for, I'm just reading, rereading this again now, and it's I feel like so much has changed mm. since you know in this year and a half. And I look back, and I was thinking, God, did I do that? Like in 2019, it feels like I did it in like 2017 or something. I mean, it really <laughs> goes back, but it's um, but it's like I, I kept thinking of Sarah Everard as being a kind of case of like people beginning to realise that there are massive systemic problems that like audiences that previously hadn't worried or engaged with them suddenly go oh my god this is us this is me this is my community this is my gender you know, whatever it is and there are forces at play which um have completely nefarious and corrupt and institutionally sort of appalling issues and i had a wake-up call as joining extinction rebellion getting into activism and then finding myself you know engaging with this problem and then that acting as a kind of door opening to suddenly realizing, you know, again, like how many layers there are, and when you see a problem that isn't your own, how difficult it is to engage and empathize and frequently kind of um, see relevance alongside the colossal number of sort of daily fuckeries that take place in amongst your own life, like a sort of deeply privileged upbringing and life, and that means that like I've been cushioned from that and then to engage with it and see it, that makes a huge difference. And I think the really interesting component of this particularly is um, the the use of and the, the creative framework around it and that that makes it so much more accessible and that it feels like a kind of um, a sort of manual or a handbook to identify these themes in future. And I think we need sort of more toolkits for people to, when I say people, I mean me and where I, something I would have liked to have had a couple of years ago um, to, to help make this, pin, create fluency in these problems and these issues that spring up and to help people. And when you mentioned a library and the sort of archival component of this, um, the sort of last line of the interview that we did in the chat we had, I'd forgotten, I'd mentioned around the idea of kind of holding people to account. And I'm now working on a project which is about holding people who are resisting climate action to account for future generations and create those archives and those um, documents and dossiers so that people can see who was causing the problems and it's a blaming and shaming thing which we weren't doing many years ago with extinction many two years ago <laughs> extinction <laughs> rebellion but um it's I, I really like that and i'm very pro recycled paper and non-plastic stuff but in this case i'm like extremely yeah, the plastic is I, like, I love that there's a lot of recycled paper in it squirming at the plastic yeah, yeah no no but it, it, it's like but again it's like the, the it's better that it passes through many hands yeah. rather you know that's more uh, there is a lot of recycled paper in it i can confirm that much of the paper is recycled in the forestry stand i think it's two percent of britain's carbon emissions but then we've wrapped it in pvc <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, I also wanted to say that, you know, talking about that, I mean, Rachel and Tarek's conversation happened like right at the beginning mm. of COVID. Mm. I mean, and I think it's mentioned that was a real, t I think that your conversation actually was a real turning moment um, because we were just really entering, it was the beginnings of that and something is revealed in that conversation mm. that you have around the kind of technology around it and some of the thinking. And I wonder like, how has it been for you? <laughs> How was your lockdown? No, like, but, you know, have you noticed, like, a change around, you know, the thinking around it? You know, we just talked, just before we kind of started this conversation, in front of the camera, we talked about the fact that a lot of the symbols you're starting to see related to other areas and, you know, protection is, and c care is something which is also, you know, extended to, into a kind of COVID language. But I'd love to hear what's happened or what you thought over that t period of time since that conversation. Yeah, I think, um, well, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Nini, thank you, Shoru. Um, you know, I just wanted to just pick up on one thing 
that was mentioned about, especially about the symbols. Because the nature prevent, especially in public institutions, it's it's meant to be invisible. It's meant to be invisible. So it's meant to be something that's sort of running efficiently in the background that no one actually feels, no one sees. <laughs> and so, you know, the reason why I'm so attentive to the symbols now is actually really thanks to you uh, because what the showroom did um, when you enter, you know, you see it's, it's really prevent is in your face. So that sort of physicality of prevent, you know, it's invisibility has become hyper visible. You feel like, okay, actually, I, this, is, this is sort of what it feels like if you're hyper, if you're hyper aware of what it's like mm. to be, uh, you know, to be uh, sort of have that embodied affective experience of feeling like you're under surveillance, which most people don't have, um, because again, prevent is supposed to be invisible. <clears throat> but of course, the symbols that carry with it, all the symbols of benevolence, uh, hand holding, you know, birds. I'm not so sure exactly right now. All the <laughs> symbols of love that uh, prevent is sort of utilizing. Um, you know, we see, we, see it, it, we see it now just being appropriated across all sort of security concerns. Um, it was really interesting, the conversation is true. We had it at the beginning, Rachel and I. Um, and I think one of the things that struck us, especially, um, you know, it, perhaps it wasn't as fully captured in here as, as you know, as we had it in terms of our, our informal conversations. But it was incredible because there was such a hyper investment in prevent, in counterterrorism. So counterterrorism is one of the fastest growing industries. Um, and it comes from the fact that we live in a risk-based society where the future is constantly colonized with threat. You know, there's always this threat somewhere around the corner and there's this responsabilization of the public, you know, see it, say it, sort it. So there's all this investment that's put into the future to prevent some kind of catastrophe from happening. And then the pandemic <laughs> you know, occurred. And lo and behold, there's actually a real threat, you know, a real, <laughs> a real public health issue. And all that, all that investment that was, that was put into the future through counterterrorism, suddenly all that money is obsolete. Right? All, this, all, the, all the infrastructure, all the public spending as it relates to what, I mean, what we saw what happened in the UK especially, you know, um, uh, you know, the beds being overfilled. I mean, really even just any, any public institution, it's just completely all the budget cuts that they've faced through austerity. We, we saw the actual discrepancy. Like, I mean, I think that, that's, that, that, was, that was such an incredible moment if, you, if, we, if someone is really attentive to how much money is invested into the invisibility of, of future catastrophe, and then you know the pandemic happens, it's it's just incredibly heartbreaking, considering all the deaths that um, that we've experienced. Um, and so, I think uh, I don't want to speak for Rachel. Uh, I think everyone uh, and everyone really should read and really read Rachel uh, Rachel's. Um, Rachel's uh, really enlightening discussions as it relates to uh, health surveillance. Um, but, you know, I think to me, I guess just the only point that, uh, you know, I found really uh, fascinating was this notion of responsibilizing the public to take care of themselves. You know, again, coming from a sort of neoliberal ideology of Let's, let's cut all the public spending on institutions. We're not paying for you anymore. Everyone sort of take care of themselves. Um, and the racism that's then involved through, you know, this notion of, okay, there is some sort of threat to the nation. Threat is racialized in public consciousness. If we think about CSA, it's sort of what, what, what color does the threat come in? Um, you know, we, we entered in discussions of, of algorithms, uh, you know, that sort of take this colorblind approach, but sort of have racism encoded within it. Mm. Um, so there's, uh, I think there's a lot of this sort of facade of benevolence, but really when you sort of dig deeper, you see just this total mismanagement and this really um, 
really almost atrocious form of uh, you know, racialized policies, which uh, frankly are just, just growing. Hmm. Yeah, it's not, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, but it's interesting, when I met Mark as well, the designer of the book, I mean, you were still working in government. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of the conversations that we had when I was doing the show, which is also why I asked you to come on board as the designer, um, was this, you know, what you were working on in terms of like legibility, especially um, doing the sort of internet and digital based design mm. for the government, but thinking about what reports look like and, you know, thinking about how you can play with that. And I wondered if you could just say like, a few things about how you've, well, not left, the, not left the position, but maybe some of the experiences of thinking like with and against some of those kind of design tendencies from within government from, to make this book, which is a kind of parallel, it's not a report, but it's in that language in a way. I think uh, a lot of the kind of prevent identity work that Tarek was just talking about is, falls into like a really interesting trap with government communications where they kind of, kind of try and talk down to the public. Mm. It's like they kind of feel like people don't understand or something like that, and they'll go, you know, you go, okay, well, you stick a logo on it that looks cute, and people think it's cute, you know, and it's fine. And, like, so much of the work that the teams that I worked with in government were trying to do was to try and, like, just cut that out entirely, and be like, don't speak down to the public, tell them what they need to know, tell them what's going on, be transparent, be clear about it. And I fundamentally believe in that from, like, a democratic perspective, that if your government isn't being straight with you and is just speaking down to you, then it's very hard to actually accurately feed back to that government what's going on and what you feel about it. Um, it was kind of interesting working on, on Tina, I think, especially having chatted with you in the vein at the beginning of it, because you were so... Uh, there were so many different places you wanted this book to work and so many different audiences and so mm. many kind of... so many spaces that this needed to talk to and both kind of feel authentic to, but also um, maybe challenge the perspectives in those places. And so it's kind of, it actually ended up being an, aesthetically it doesn't look that dissimilar to some of the government work that I would work on, <laughs> but um, kind of perspective wise, it was almost entirely different. Whereas like government work is like an authority subject and you're an authority kind of group and you're trying to strip away all of those signs of authority and just get them to speak transparently about what they want to do. And whereas with Tina, there's almost like this kind of collection of different voices who are frequently not heard in these spaces. And you were trying to wrap these different voices and different perspectives and different opinions in something that would kind of legitimize them in a lot of these spaces that only really takes these like serious documents mm. seriously, but do that in a way that wasn't just masking the kind of difference and different voices that sing underneath it. Well, it's also like, about complexity and then one of the nice things we talked about was this idea of the palimpsest so again like in the archive section like there are these layers and layers and layers of the original documents but also the parts that we've pulled out which we're, we find interesting that are kind of highlights of it but then also these kind of layers of commentary commentary taken from the exhibition itself when people were leaving post-it notes or conversations that we'd some of us had had like in the space um, and that, you know, there's a, there's a, you, you've kind of stayed with the trouble of the complexity of those layers where everything is visible, like you can read down all those layers. Like there's no, there's none, no layer is, not, is less visible. You know, there's a clarity to all of them, which is a real feat, I think, for the designer, but also for a reader, right, to be able to take in all that information. It definitely challenges transparency, I would say. Yeah, it does, but I mean, that's the like reality of anything simple. Is always there's always something more complex behind it. Mm. Um, it's one of those interesting ideas, you know. Like a, a great deal of my work has been with kind of more digital technologies and online and things like that. And you have these kind of really interesting things like Wikipedia or version control, like GitHub on the internet, where you can just keep digging and you can see previous versions of things. You can see different <laughs> layers of information. Um, and I think. The more you work with those types of media, the more you take for granted that there are layers of complexity behind every kind of simple message and every uh, 
bold statement, every grand statement, like there's a lot more complexity behind it. And I mm. think those of us who've grown up with the internet kind of just assume that to most of the world. Um, yeah, trying to take that complexity and wrap it back into a print object that doesn't necessarily let you drill in. Yeah. It's quite interesting. And you know, we kind of made, made an aesthetic statement almost with the presentation of the information to kind of imply that. Yeah. And I think that's true of the title in a way. Like, Tina is like a very simple title that really doesn't tell you much about if, you, if your book was called Tina, you wouldn't necessarily <laughs> know Tina. Yeah, it's like a novel about a teenage girl, you know, yeah. living yeah. somewhere in England. Like, you wouldn't necessarily understand that. Yeah, I mean, like, I, we had a bit of discussion back and forwards because I was yeah. not knowing the context to it. I was kind of a bit. I had She's, I feel like Tina has become a person. Who Tina's name is, you know, yeah. like what we're kind of saying. But Tina's it, also become like a per, like a person. Yeah. I think in our lives, like, mm. you know, there is like this figure. Tina even has an email address, actually. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, there is it has it is kind of personified. But it starts with this very simple statement of this name, which is in itself simple. That is then the statement that we talked about with Rob. There is no alternative, which is also a simplification, right? I mean. And then the, the kind of the layers you dig down and the complexity of that is really where like we're all invested, I would say. Like we're all working at a different layer and we have to kind of bring that all of that to the surface, which I think we've really tried to do, even if it is wrapped in this mm -hmm. you know, this kind of like quite sort of Swiss complex like simplicity almost, mm -hmm. like on the outside. It actually contains a huge amount of complexity inside. I wonder if it's worth mentioning the prevent green as well. Yeah. So we talked a lot about complexity, but we could also talk about, um, I guess, that aspect of the poor image. Mm. And I was thinking about the logos and the symbols that you collected, especially uh, throughout the show. And I remember this remarkable point when I was engaging with the, the archive when I first visited, where you had discovered that part of a particular... Uh, police forces prevent logo was purchased from a stock image site mm. and this logo also functioned as a logo for a whole range of different yeah. services and like a cleaning firm or something yeah. like that mm. and we Mannering, money laundering and ma yeah exactly and so we we've got this aspect of complexity and the detail and the the the, the choral aspect of the book in terms of bringing all of these voices together sometimes in dissonance and sometimes in harmony but there's also this aspect of the slight kind of crappiness yeah. of prevent and do you know what i mean and, and and of its design and um the lack of care yeah um or sometimes the basicness of the decisions taken to rely on um cliched uh, symbolism such as holding hands and birds releasing from from uh, trees or whatnot um, to belie these the quite grotesque mm. kind of function of the of the um, of the strategy, and we have this green wraparound cover which um, which clashes slightly with the green thread, which clashes slightly with the green of the text in the dialogue section, and we really embraced that sense that there was no uniformity of the prevent green. I think I found like, at least a, a dozen different prevent greens like available like online because of like the different resolutions mm. of screens. Yeah. But also like now, I mean, I know that in conversations that I have, like we all see pr this particular shade of like lime green has become prevent green. Like, as a as a name like, and as mm. a way we identify like, i see it all the time or like yeah. then you'll take a photo and like send it to me like oh let's prevent green <laughs> again or like you know you see it in unexpected places but this really politicized color that was originally the color of the, the prevent duty right yeah yeah mm. Mm. and also those, going back to those the kind of the stock images that we use that mm. that's um I mean, I think that the, in the archive, the, the thing that was fascinating were all of your, your digging into where those images had come from and the emails that you had with people and finding out that they had kind of organically emerged mm. within local police forces and at quite a kind of sort of low bureaucratic level. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that kind of begs the question, which I think is the ultimate question of Prevent is, is Prevent the kind of the, the, the gross racialized surveillance of Prevent? Is that something has prevent created a space that has enabled something that's quite dark within British society to emerge, that's already there, or is prevent imposing that 
on society and, and making it become. And I, and I guess there's, the answer is that there's a bit of both, but I think we need to understand that in both directions. And I think looking at, you know, you're looking at the symbolisms and emerging all over the country separately probably mm. says something about that. I saw that sort of lack of care as being a kind of um, intentional flippancy mm. to bring people yeah. to a point where you can just casually pick this one up, invent it, and then drop it, and it's done its job, which is to shift the window towards something where it's acceptable to... Mm. Yeah, know, and the other, the other thing is with that is of being... Coming back to the pandemic that Tarek was talking about, you prevent has local authorities, local governments have been, or local government has had most responsibility removed from it. Prevent is one of the few things responsibilities that they're left with, and a bit like responsibilizing the public to to be careful around the pandemic, and then it's the public's fault when there's a spike in infections and people are dying in hospitals. Um, that it's responsibilized to a local level. So local government, which the current central government doesn't like, can only fail at this. You can't demonstrate success with prevent. You can only fail. Mm -hmm. I think that's a you know on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know we've all kind of watched the the independent prevent review sort of already fail several times in its delivery and also within itself at the moment that it's perpetually failing to come out. We still haven't seen it. Still hasn't emerged. It's supposed to come out in December. Yeah, that's what you know. But it's still not there. But it will also probably kind of. You know, there won't even be a ripple effect by the t you know by the time it comes out. And you know, we've talked a little bit, like maybe on a kind of concluding note, about whether you know prevent might actually be like sacked off, like quietly, in favour of something worse. You know. Yeah, I, I think we've got the the the, government, the current government have got such control of all the various kind of accountability mechanisms and systems within government. Um, around kind of control of universities, free speech czars, and all the other things that they're putting in place, that I, think, I, I personally think it's entirely possible that prevent would be scrapped, um, and I think it could, if certainly at Shawcross were to announce it, it would be, I personally think, quite a shrewd move of the government because it would take the wind out of a lot of activist sails, mm -hmm. and I think it's important that people remember that, um, you know, because there has been a lot of activism directed specifically at prevent, and I'm something that I've been part of. We also need to remember that this is a, you know, it's part of a, of a far greater and equally dark project that covers many other facets of society mm. and government. Yeah, and we can't just like, you know, if that does happen, like this book and there are going to be like many other reports and kind of, you know, independent independent reviews or parallel reviews or people's reviews that have to be part of how we understand that this is something that existed in our community for like... 16 but, but this, years but if, if prevent, longer. But if Prevent gets scrapped in name, though, this will still be totally relevant. Yeah. Because all the all the surveillance structure, all the racism yeah, is, it's not going is there. Anywhere. It's, just, it's just the removal of a name. They tr they, the Home Office tried a few years ago to rebrand Prevent as Engage. Um, and <laughs> and it was, yeah, they, it was kind of leaked early on, so they then had to abandon that. But um, mm. it'll be that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. There's, there's also something doing the Cage International Witness campaign like there was a panel discussion the other day and talking about the way that prevent has been then sold out internationally mm -hmm. and so even if you know if it's scrapped in the UK it's been packaged up and become this kind of like an international presence that then you know it it, it continues to live but tying back into what Tarek was saying about yeah that it's an industry that's and it's been kind of increasing as a kind of profit making structure as well and then, and then, if that, if the end goal is a, is is the profit, then where does the care sit within, you know, within mm. that framework? But yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to turn to the point a bit. So I think, if in the course of organising against prevent for quite a few years, I've always come across a similar issue where people sort of, um, like, they understand prevent is like a policy, and they're from law from above, like they want to know what the policy is, how to sort of tackle it, and what to sort of who the actors involved in it in a very like clear cut way. Um, but I think what's often missed is sort of obviously it is a policy, it's also in many ways like a social practice which is sort of embedded in, reinforced and reproduced through sort of daily interactions, including through authority figures like teachers and so on. And I think what, why that matters is that, you know, print obviously within the wider sort of um, counter apparatus. And I think what we've seen is that, you know, print is sort of this wider, ap sorry, the wider apparatus of counterterrorism has gradually come to fill the space in British politics um, that has been vacated by, you know, um, social welfare programs and programs mm -hmm. and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So we're seeing, you know, social problems being dealt with security issues uh, more and more rather than political ones. Uh, we've seen this, for example, at yeah, Footprint, obviously, 
for the mass PR campaigns, like I think I mentioned, sort of CSA sort of stuff on trains, and sort of mass conscription of the public into sort of um, work on terrorism more broadly. Uh, and I think also the framework of pre-crime now sort of expands beyond prevent has been using sort of like a, a countering quote unquote gangs, a sort of youth file and so on. Um, my notes, sorry. Um, I think this begins, I think that's why the sort of issue of solidarity, like so central to our conversation, because um, if you recognize the friend is not just, it does not start and stop with the policy itself, um, and recognizing that it's itself a means for re re-engineering, reorganizing society, even the question of solidarity becomes a lot more uh, more concrete in some ways, and more, more you know, um, what's the word? a lot more compelling to how we organize against it. So finally, I guess I would tie into the original point is that, um, so obviously under, under so Tina, there's no alternative was Margaret Thatcher's phrase, sort of a way of sort of um, presenting sort of the market economy and capitalism as sort of the, you know, the, sort of the un, unassailable, uncontestable like, fact of social life. Uh, and I think in the 20 years since that was sort of introduced in the, in the 80s onwards, we saw obviously the cult of individualism, individualism come into place, sort of like uh, shift towards entrepreneurialism as sort of um, the idea of self-sufficiency, and sort of the undercut the sort of um, more collectivist social welfare model that exists prior to that. I think from 2001, we saw the war on terror, that has become, took an even harsher turn. We've seen um, this sort of, the, yeah, this sort of, um, that individualism turned you know, sort of more, more sharply towards like a mutual suspicion of one another. Mm -hmm. So we went from like collectivity to individualism to sort of mutual suspicion of one another. I think what we're seeing now is 20 years of the war on terror come to maturation. We sort of need to um, overcome and do and sort of combat that mm -hmm. sort of very real social fallout from it, rather than to see it as abstract policies or laws or even mm -hmm. wars out there. Uh, it has very impact. Uh, sorry, has had a very concrete impact in terms of how we relate to one another, uh, within society, and um, yeah, among the populace. So, mm. yeah, solidarity. I think is uh, the kind of key to come out of that. And I definitely feel that this is a document that took a huge amount of solidarity to bring into being. <laughs> you know, and I hope that that's also what it leaves with, and that it will always kind of be in encased in it. You know, in the plastic cup. Sorry, <laughs> um, will be that sense of solidarity that you know existed before we started this project and I hope we'll continue like well after it as well and, and reinvigorate that conversation around you know who that solidarity is for and who's part of it too. Naveen, do you see this as an art project or do you see it as more personally? As more than an art project. Yeah, or how do you see this, what you've yeah. done at Chelsea? I mean, is it an art it project or is it a piece of activism or is it a piece of policy work? I don't I think it sits somewhere between those things because they're all things I care about. But I'm not like, I mean, I would call myself, I'm not going to say, oh, I'm not an artist. I am an artist. Um, I'm not an activist because I've got too much respect for what activists really do. And I know that I don't do that. But I think that the, it, the possibility of using art as a framework and a place from which to have this conversation is like you said, like perhaps art spaces are some of the few that are not surveilled, that does not have this kind of culture of, um, mutual suspicion. I mean, it has many forms of mutual suspicion, but in this particular case, like we haven't been kind of overwhelmed by a pre like a prevent type structure, so we could have that conversation. I think it's about activating the space of art to be something that is just a bit more meaningful. That is about solidarity, but it's also about like taking a conversation which is happening in mental health. It's happening in teaching it's happening in academic uh, you know academic areas in environmentalism in all these areas like into one place like there aren't many places that can actually accommodate that <laughs> there really aren't um and i just felt like we had to use this one space that existed to do that um so it's not art but i don't think art is what art used to be anymore and it can't be that and I think it's got to change and be other things to other people, you know. That's a gateway, isn't it? I mean, I think that I reflect on what you were saying about the Louvre and the sense of um, the kind of art historical legitimization of Islam and the aestheticization, perhaps, um, to make it, as you know, so palatable to a public. And I like to think that that's not what your show did, but your show did provide a at your activities on this book by extension provide a gateway for um, a, a local public as the book demonstrates the um, shutters of the showroom mm. were open nearly all the time that you were mm. artists, you were building your um, murals in the space and people it provided a means to invite people to cross a threshold both literally mm. and kind of um, 
conceptually or, or emotionally to engage with these ideas. Um, so it's not about aestheticizing this process of learning, but allowing us space for unlearning and a space for... You can um, also question aesthet the aesthetics of something without it being about aesthetics. Like, you true. can question design, you know, you can question, like, the message of symbols and logos without it being, like, needing, like, a degree in aesthetics, mm. you know, mm. or, like, using that kind of theoretical language. Um, it's available, kind of, to everyone. Mm. Mm. And I um, think it's, it's countering that climate of fear through enabling a space, like, like something that I personally experienced when... You know, when there is no alternative was open and the, the, the many voices that came together, but both within agreement and disagreement, but it was possible to have yeah. to have that to hold that within within the space and to enable that rather than the chilling effect that Rob writes so clearly about in his text. Like and from your personal experience of teaching, um, that yeah, it seems like the climate of fear, the see it say it sorted really, you know, it it, it squashes the capacity for mm. kind of for people to air concerns or to you know and to to find a space in between all of that and the kind of for complexity and maybe that's where I felt like Tina like the exhibition and now within the book that it really that it enables that mm. the, the kind of within and across difference to kind of co uh, yeah cohabit within this space mm. I think there are, there are kind of certainly you know, Tarek and I have been talking about prevents ever since you arrived in the UK from, from Canada and um, and there are quite a, you know there are quite a few of us kind of who are, who are sort of have been talking about prevents and uh, you know a lot of conversations online a few conversations in coffee shops um, but yeah it doesn't then it doesn't nothing emerges from that and I think well the things that do emerge are academic articles books but those are all quite um, they're quite constrained mm. no one can actually necessarily say what they think there are kind of there are guidelines to those those things whereas I think there's a lot more um juice uh, yeah there's a lot, <laughs> a lot more thought in yeah. in this and and by that I, I mean you know just you know things that people are, are thinking rather than necessarily everything having to be mm. kind of referenced and cross reference cross -reference. well uh, also the peer, yeah the peer reviewing f form of this book was also to do an open digital um, editorial possibility and it was peer reviewed by our peers which are an enormous group of people it wasn't peer reviewed by academics yeah. mm. but i think we might conclude at that point because we're running over a little yeah, bit and some of our contributors need to leave so so yeah, thank you so much and I'm really looking forward to this book going out into the world and being in libraries and being handled and having coffee spilt on it and being referenced, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's a, a tool for use. Object. Yeah, it's a Absolutely. tool for use, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for this dialogue this evening. And we're going to be, everyone is going to be contributing to the distribution of the, of the publication in the sense of suggesting which libraries or schools or you know public spaces they feel it would be most beneficial for the book to be present so in that way kind of de democratizing the distribution so that's like after the, the the kind of the afternoon that we're having at Claire de Rue on, on Saturday yeah. that will be the next step of really put, like making it really yeah. as widely publicly available as possible so thank okay. you thank, thank you, you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. thanks everyone